You are listening to the EdTech Takeout from Grantwood AEA, an educational service agency that supports school districts in eastern Iowa with a focus on equity, excellence, and efficiency in education for all children. Welcome to episode 38 of the EdTech Takeout, the podcast that serves up bite-sized technology tips for teachers. My name is Jonathan Wiley, and I'm joined again by Mindy Carney. Hello, here we go. Another episode? Another episode, 38. I, I never know what to say at the beginning of the episode, Mindy. We what? used to have like, you oh, know, I know. Gimmicky. We used to have some gimmicks. Some gimmicks and some fun and yeah. stuff. But now, now we don't have fun or what? We're putting our business socks on, I hear. <laughs> is that right? I know. I'm on a time crunch today. Every minute of my day is planned. So I told Wiley to put his business socks on. We needed to get going here. Well, we better get started then. <laughs> All right. So um, you did the Chromebook challenge. I did do a Chromebook challenge. Yeah, what did you yes. think? Um, I had thoughts, and I, I tried to record them throughout the week as pros and cons. Yeah. So um, I'm reading uh, When by Daniel Pink right now. Yeah. And he said that uh, if you've got good news and bad news to give, yeah. you should always start with the bad news. Yes. And then end with the good news. Okay, so let's. What's what are your cons? All right, so here's my cons, and they're not really, you know, big things, but... Um, on the particular Chromebook that I had, yeah. there was no VGA or HDMI input uh-huh. for like connected to projectors or monitors and things. It was right. USB C only. Yes. Which is like on that new MacBook that that uh, Lynn, Lynn has. has. Yeah. Yeah. That you have to carry a bunch of dongles around. <laughs> yep, you do. <laughs> so um, I needed a a dongle to connect to my um, monitor and to projectors and everything else yeah. out there. Um, but you know, not a deal breaker, I guess, but just, uh, the future is, uh, USB-C, but it's, uh, not quite now. Yeah. And with Google cast and stuff, you can use that in the classroom. It's more just that you go, you like fly into a classroom and fly out or whatever, yeah. using a projector or whatever, but you know, in a classroom, you might have like Google cast set up or something like that. Instead. I feel like we're still like trying to catch up with like HDMI, let yeah. alone, you know, yes, USB-C, true. but I would agree. Uh, so that was uh, one of the things. Um, I did feel it was a little bit slower than mm, my Mac. Did really? you find it was slower when you uh-uh. used it? I don't remember that. I saw, mm. I mean, I couldn't work out if this was observational or not, but things like opening a slides presentation oh. took a little bit longer. If I had lots of tabs open sure. at once, it seemed to be a little bit slower. But yeah. I mean, and I'll probably say this again later. I'm, I'm comparing a, a $350 Chromebook with yeah, a... Right. You know, a four-digit uh, MacBook Pro. Yeah, I mean, sure. I don't want to say it that way, but it just was a little bit slower. Yeah. Um, okay. I I didn't really like having lots of tabs open, and so when I first started using it, it's it's tab city. Yeah. Isn't sure. It? Uh-huh. You keep <laughs> uh, everything open. Yeah, and, but yeah. And I worked out you can open a tab as a separate window, and right. I, so it's kind of like an app and things like that on there yeah. too. So I did that on there too. Okay. Uh, screen size, a little small when I was just using the Chromebook by itself. Agreed. Yeah. Because it's like 11.6 yeah. inches or something yeah. like that. And uh, used to have been, you know, 13 inches or, or larger on yeah. the MacBook. Do you find it was heavy? No. You don't think compared so? Compared to your Mac? Like when you're toting that Chromebook around in your backpack compared to your Mac? Yeah, I I don't think compared to the Mac, yeah, that I have now is a big. It's a bit heavy, but yeah, it was like I mean, it was fairly lightweight, but it was yeah. like three pounds still. Oh my gosh! How do you did you look up the specifics on that? I did look up the specifics um, on shocker. that. Shocker! Yeah, okay. Uh, so I mean, it's lighter, but yeah. it's not like light. I don't think. I mean, I still yeah, like okay. I still like three iPads. Yeah, but you know, I don't know. So I mean, that just did you use the touch screen at all? I did. Yeah, what did you think of that? I didn't mind it at all. I quite yeah. liked the touch screen. Yeah. Um, it was useful just for things like that. I mean, I, it has a stylus, this yeah. one that we had. it was This was an Acer Chromebook Spin 11, mm-hmm. and it was okay. The yeah. stylus was okay. I mean, it wasn't great. It's not like using a, a Surface Pro Pen or an yeah, Apple sure. Pencil, but it's because it's a lot cheaper and, and things like that. But it was it was good for what it was. Yeah. had some versatility to it. Okay. So what did you, what were your pros for your Chromebook? So pros, yeah. Um, I mean, 
I, I don't. I didn't think I'd be able to admit this, but I, I oh. kind of forgot I was using a Chromebook sometimes. Really? I know. Because hmm. you, you can like you can hide the the dock along the bottom, you know, where all okay. your apps and things are. Yeah. And then you're just in a web browser, and if you don't think about it, yeah, you don't really right notice you're using a Chromebook, do you? No, you don't. Okay. So what? I, I'm curious though, like what things did you use on the Chromebook? Did you have to find replacements for some of the stuff that you normally use on your Mac? For the week that I chose, not not really too yeah. much. Not you too chose much. an easy week. I chose a like, week. Yeah, where I don't I really didn't have much going on this week to replace <laughs> yeah. too much. Yeah, 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 yeah I did. Mm. I mean, because I mean, I, I will still use things, some online tools like Canva, or sure, you can still use TweetDeck. You can still use yeah. you know other stuff that I might usually have apps or different things for mm. battery life was good yeah right battery life is very good like days <laughs> yeah, you go days it was a day long and a half time for sure. yeah, yeah a day and a half or so yeah. i mean depending on how much you use it the battery life is really good yeah. um but then it's a smaller screen it's not such a high resolution and, sure. and stuff like that so it should be better but it was good yeah i experimented a bit with uh android apps yeah i know did you do that no i did not uh-uh I don't even know. I don't think that was even a possibility when I did the Chromebook challenge because that's only been in the last six months. Yeah, it's been recently. I'm not yeah. sure what the and time frame is. And it's been a while was. since I spilled my coffee on my computer. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I, I used things like uh, Toontastic on yeah. the Chromebook. Yeah. Which was kind of interesting, I sure. thought. And uh, like Adobe Draw mm-hmm. from the iPad yeah. uh, version. I used that uh, or the Android version, I should yeah. say. So that was kind of interesting, and I'll put a link in the show notes for any schools that are thinking about doing that. But there is a management thing where you can go in and approve certain apps that you mm-hmm. want people to be able to download. Because by default, you can't just go to the Play Store and download whatever you want. Right. So as a domain, yeah. you have to decide what to whitelist, right? Kind of like exactly. it, you can do that with extensions too. Yes. Right. So, um, but it's it's worth checking out, worth trying that one. Hmm. Um, the convertible. Nature was was kind of fun. I thought. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could bend it back and yeah. the screen all the way back and use it like a tablet. I'd say it's a little bit heavy for that. Oh but, my you know, gosh, it, you're so picky. I guess. So this is my question, though, because you and I use different Chromebooks. When I was using it as a tablet, my keyboard was still engaged, and I wanted oh, yeah? it kind of to disengage because then I was kind of like I would be holding it as a tablet Mm -hmm. and I would push a button because I was holding it and it would like type or like mess you know what I mean yeah so did you notice that I didn't I I think we use different Chromebooks or slightly different Chromebooks so the one I use it maybe there was a software update or something that fixed that but usually once you flipped it back over the keyboard just was disabled and it it didn't interfere Mm. at all so that was good good but you're not giving up your MacBook. Um, you know, if I had to, you know. It wouldn't be the end of the world. It wouldn't be the end of the world, no. Yeah. It's one of those things that I think you would just adapt to. I mean, yeah. I think we're used to using our MacBooks yeah. every day. Like and we're we probably are. more power users, right? I yeah. I mean, really, if you think about it. Yeah. So. We, we need more of those power features. And yeah. A bit more um, processing power and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, if I got a new job somewhere or if Grabwood yeah. said, you know what, we're, we're just not doing spending Chromebooks. Money on it. Yeah. Then yeah, yeah, you could get by for the most part. You wouldn't cry yourself to sleep at no, night. No, I'd probably just about how heavy it was. Yeah, you, you want know, it to be lighter. I'd, I'd hide the MacBook in the back room somewhere just for those <laughs> just days to where pull it out when you needed to. Yeah, you know, when we're podcasting <laughs> and we're doing other things like that. Yeah, yeah. But overall, yeah, it was it was pretty good. Well, I'm glad you did it. I do have a a one a one oh. last thing to say. Though. Okay, because I brought my soapbox with me. Oh boy. Uh huh. I feel like you know. Some things um, did work better in Chrome. Okay. Now, wait, wait, oh, wait. Oh, this is, I'm wait. on the edge of my seat. This is going to be super fun. This okay. might not go where you think it's oh, going. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah. So things like Canva, for example, yeah. works a lot better in Chrome than it does in Firefox. Okay. There's like certain things you click on and it's just more responsive mm-hmm. and things load better. And that makes me a little sad because... Oh, no. I know where this is going. Yeah, this is yes. where I'm going now. Mm-hmm. I don't think things should work better in one, in browser, one browser than another. Right. I think when you think about the web being open and stuff like that, that mm-hmm. you you want everything just to work everywhere yes, on right. whatever browser. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I read this article and um, I might have shared it online or with you guys. Yeah, I don't know. Yep. But there was a time when, you know, we had this problem with Internet Explorer. 
Yeah. And it was like, works best in Internet Explorer. And uh-huh. everyone was like, oh, gosh, do I need to use Internet Explorer. Or you're changing browsers just to use yeah, certain sure. websites. And so we got things like, you know, Canva works a lot better in Chrome. Weebly works better in Chrome. And then just, there's things like Book Creator for yeah. Chrome, mm-hmm. which only works in Chrome. Mm-hmm. And, I, and then like Google Earth on the web only works in Chrome right now. And it's... yeah. I don't think we should get to the stage where things are just built for one web browser instead of another Mm -hmm. because that really divides stuff and limits opportunities for people. Right. I don't know if it's one of those deals where, you know, you're restricting other browsers or whether you're just optimizing it for Chrome. Yeah. And I think we should be optimizing for all browsers. Right. Yeah. I agree. Okay. I agree. So there you go. Okay. Just a small soapbox. Yes. With a big topic. It's a big topic, actually. Yeah, it's maybe a topic for it. another day. Yeah, yeah. I right. mean, you get into net neutrality and all, and all yeah. that kind of stuff as right. well. But, um, yeah, I think definitely for schools, it would be more advantageous for everybody if we just had open access. Yeah, I agree. So um, kind of moving on a little bit, when you were using the Chromebook, though, you and I both did the inbox challenge, too. Did you use it? Was this at the same time? Were you inboxing and Chromebooking at the same time? I was inboxing <laughs> and Chromebooking at the same time. <laughs> Why don't you tell us what you thought about inbox? Um. Well, I the one thing I like about inbox, first of all, is that I think um, I like the interface of it. I think it's much more sleek and um, it just looks updated and more current. I liked that. Um, I like the built-in snooze feature. Because I like my inbox to be at zero. So um, it allowed snoozing kind of allowed me to cheat a little bit. So yes. I could take something out of my inbox um, that wasn't necessarily what I would consider complete and snooze it to a different time. And I could even schedule it to pop up at a certain time, which I really liked. Um um, so I really liked those things. I actually like the low priority tab, which you can also kind of have in Gmail too, mm-hmm. of sorts. You know, I just never really used it. Um, but I did find that Inbox was putting things in low priority that I didn't agree with, like okay. emails from the team. Oh, okay. Well, as long like, as it what? wasn't emails from me. It, well, no, they weren't from you. They were actually from Lynn Kleinmeyer, which I thought was uh-huh. kind of funny. I'm like, oh, you haven't quite moved up the ranks of seniority yet if your emails are still going into my um, low priority. But I I was sitting right next to her, and she's like, I sent you an email, and I did the 30-second you know, undo send wait, and I'm like, I right. still don't have it. I still don't have it. What's going on? And I went into my low priority, and it was like a shared Google Doc. So huh. I was kind of surprised about that. Um I will say that I hate, and I will say hate, the a fact that you cannot use contact groups in Inbox. Oh, yes. It drove me crazy. What in the world? So I had to cheat a couple times, too, because I had to go into my Gmail to use my contact groups. Yeah. What? What? I know. I, and there's it, like there's like six, seven people on our team, and I always forget somebody, oh, randomly different people, oh, whenever sure. I'm typing it out. That's nice to know. And I'm like, so I've got six people here. Who's the other person I need yeah. on that? And I always forget who that is. But contact groups, you just type in tech team, yeah, and everybody's, and everybody's there, there. But you can't do that in inbox which is so i was emailing one of my classes i was teaching and i have i always make a contact group for that group okay um so then i can later kind of email them and just check in whatever and have everybody kind of organized so for me to try and use inbox with the 20 people that i have in that class Mm -hmm. not possible (laughs) it's not possible I tell so you what. I, that. I tell you what I did like though. I did like the quick replies. Yeah. Do you like those? Yeah, because I use them on my app all the time. Oh, in the Gmail mobile yeah, app. Right. Yes. Yes. So I like that addition too. They're kind of, they're good, but they're they're kind of creepy sometimes. It's weird, right? Isn't it weird that, that it's they like they know how you would respond. They know the context the correct, of the email yes, and something's and what, reading some my stuff. Yes, but I I did find it was very easy just to like click that. Yeah. Even as like an email starter, yeah. it's like oh, mm-hmm. thanks for the information and. Yep. Uh, would be the quick reply, and then you Agreed. just add what you want on there. Yeah. Do you want to know the other things that we're missing that I had to look up? Well, yeah, I know. I think I know what they are because we okay. talked about them, but go ahead. Well, what there's, else? There's no labs. Yeah. There's no filters. Right. Um, undo send is available, but you have to set it up in Gmail. Gmail. Wasn't that weird? Yeah, that is kind of If you well, wanted to go back and change your 30 seconds or something to 20 yeah, right. seconds, you have you'd to have to go, go into go, Gmail. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, I feel like undo send should, yeah, just be a built-in feature too, like contact groups. 
my profile picture was different <laughs> in inbox. That was like the best email I got last week. Then it was in Gmail, and I don't understand that. <laughs> But it looked fine on my screen. Yeah, like so your you... emails for me. So Wiley, if, for those of you that don't know him, is currently bald, and but by choice, right? Um, partly. Shaved head. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. We'll just say that. Although his old picture from like how long ago would you say that picture is from? Probably ten years ago. Okay, um, he's got hair, and so um, that's the picture that was showing up as inbox is his head with hair, and he was worried that that picture was going out to everybody. <laughs> so I was sending Mindy emails saying, "What what is my profile picture? <laughs> Does look it like? look like this? <laughs> yeah. Oh goodness, no." Yeah, so and I never worked out how to fix that yet. And the yeah. other thing that is a little weird it, on the same lines as that was yep. my signature was a bit different. Yeah, because I have this lo little logo on the bottom of my yeah. signature for our um, the, the brand Wayne register yes, uh, the, yeah. workplace thing. Yeah, and it was the different one. It was like one from at least a year ago. So I, I don't know why that didn't carry over. Yeah, uh, there's no unread mail icon in the tab. Browser. That is true. Although I have the unread mail Chrome extension, so I actually uh, have it. Okay. So I can see I have seven emails in my inbox right now. Okay. But it's not on my tab. You can't mute email threads. You can't use templates. You can't change your signature. You can use templates. There's templates in there. Templates in there? Yeah, like canned responses, okay. right? Oh, I didn't see those. Yeah, it's not called canned responses. It's called mm -hmm. templates. Maybe I was saying you can't use canned responses. Then. Oh, yeah. Maybe I should have said that. Yeah. Okay. I wonder if they should still show up in your templates, though. That I don't know. I haven't used a canned response in a while. Yeah, so you can't change the signature. You can't set an out-of-office reply. I feel like that's kind of Why basic. Why didn't you even think about that? I know, like when you're going away on a, at a yeah. conference or on right. vacation or whatever, you have to go back to Gmail and turn uh -huh. on your out-of-office reply. You can't add any other email accounts either. Like uh, if you wanted yeah. to check multiple email accounts right. in one place. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, that was it. There is a button on there, though, that makes me nervous. What button Have you is seen that? there's a button? I think it's in the top right-hand corner. It does, it's called Sweep. Oh, I haven't that. And it just that. basically empties your entire inbox. So, but the way that works, though, is then you pin ones that you want to work on, right? And then exactly. does it bring them back, though? It, it keeps the pin so things. So it snoozes a, bun it basically, snoozes a bunch of them? I think it marks them all as done. Oh, I know. I'm scared of hitting that by mistake <laughs> by and then mistake. emptying my inbox. I wonder and if going, an undo Ooh. pops up, though. Maybe. Because there is some undos within, you know, if you do something within your inbox. Try and see, Mindy. See if it works. Um, if my inbox wasn't so crazy right now, <laughs> I would try it. But it's I'm working to inbox zero right now. The, the design I like, though. I mean, the yeah. design is the reason why I'm still using it. Yeah. I love being able to hide the sidebar with all my labels and everything. Yeah. I get rid of that. Mm-hmm. So it's missing some stuff, and I think yeah. it will get there in the end, but... I don't know. I'm converted. Yeah, I think I am, too. All right, so up next, main course, Serve to You Piping Hot, Chromebook Creativity. And this topic actually comes from a blog post titled An American Chromebook Crisis, New report shows sad trends of how students are using devices. And it was written by Andy Lasek. Correct. Um, and actually, I came across it um, through Chad Kafka. He was one that shared it. So to give him a hat tip for that as well. But um, this is an interesting blog post, I thought, because GoGuardian um, releases a report yearly that analyzes um, how devices are being used that are managed through their system. Um, so about 5 million students. Yeah. So you think it'd be a pretty good representative yeah. Five million survey kids. sample. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they then analyzed what tools students are using. Um, so it was very eye opening, especially I think for, for us and our team and, um, kind of taking a look at it. So he actually had a couple different rants <laughs> that he had through, um, his blog post. So do you just, should we just read them? Do you think? And then discuss, how do you want to, how do you want to hammer this out? Yeah, I think it'd be fair. I mean, right. and, Andy interpreted the data and on here. Sure. I mean, I don't think GoGuardian put any kind of, uh, slant or anything no, on it. Right. They just said, here's This the data, his, yeah. here's what we're seeing yep. people using. And with so many of our districts now using Chromebooks, 
um, I thought this could be an interesting yeah. topic of conversation yeah. um, to see where that goes. So he had, he had, like you said, he had three main uh, points he wanted to make, three rants, as he called yeah. them, that we thought we'd uh, try and address and talk a little bit about. So hit so, us with rant one. Uh, yeah, so one thing I would point out, though, is that he, they took out um, all the G Suite apps for education that students are using so that those were really the top uses of the Chromebook. Yeah, for sure. Um, so he took that information, or they took that information out, and then from there analyzed the tools that were being used after. Yeah. Next in line. I think that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So rant number one, and mm. I quote, A huge amount of Chromebook use is being spent on educationally questionable video games, low-level assessments, and YouTube with the two highest trending websites for over 5 million learners after G Suite for Education being Cool Math Games and Renaissance Learning, the parent company to Accelerated Reader and other assessments. So what do you think of that, Mindy? Well, um, I actually, Cool Math Games, like I've heard of it, but I never went and looked. Um, but after seeing that, I'm like, Cool Math Games, like I've never even like recommended that. I don't even, you know, I went and looked at it. And uh, no, I wouldn't probably recommend Cool Math Games, mostly because I, the two, three games I played didn't really have any math involved. Um, they were more just like video game things. Um, and then... Uh, I cannot hide my opinion about Accelerated Reader. I'm not a huge fan of Accelerated Reader uh, because I just feel like there's other ways for students to um, share what they're learning and reading about. Um, I will not step on my soapbox about Accelerated Reader here, but I um, I have to admit I was surprised. Were you surprised? I was I was surprised. I mean, I didn't know. I couldn't really guess which would have come up, but um, yeah, right. seeing those two on there... I mean, cool math games, I think, in, maybe in defense of them, I don't think they're necessarily pitching themselves as a, as a curricular supplement right. for, for schools. I would they're agree. not really trying to tie it to the curriculum or anything. Right. They're trying to put some games in there where you could, uh, I don't know, practice some rote math skills and sure. things like that on there. Accelerate Reader, I don't know. I mean, I've never used that in the classroom. Um, not necessarily through choice. I've just never been in, in a classroom or a school that has uh, used that as part of their curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I know people have strong opinions on it. <laughs> so, I mean, this is something you're going to talk about a bit at the yes. Iowa One to One conference. Yeah. So, um, actually, Lynn Kleinmeyer and I are um, going to be sharing it a couple of different times in the next few months where uh, we're going to be sharing some ideas of things that you can do to substitute for Accelerated Reader um, to kind of grow. Um, literacy community instead of just hammering out some quizzes on books that you've read. So right. look for that at one-to-one -one if you'll be there. And so the, uh, could you summarize the kind of main objections that, that people have to Accelerated Reader in terms of, in case anybody's not familiar with it? Um, yeah, so I guess my biggest thing about Accelerated Reader, I think, is that it doesn't so much put emphasis on growing a love of reading so much as it is about um, kind of an extrinsic motivation to attain points right. because of a book you've read. So um, I, I, I think that's a problem. I think uh, my son just said to me the other day, he, he doesn't love to read. He's a great reader doesn't love to read, finally found a book that he couldn't stop talking about. And I just happened to say to him, hey, whatever happened with the ending of that book? And I, he said, I didn't finish it, mom. And I said, why not? He goes, well, because I'm done testing for Accelerated Reader this semester and I might as well get the points next semester. Oh. So yeah. I, I, I just think that that kind of maybe shows, you know, what the mindset of some, some students, my student doesn't mean it's everybody's student, but um, just yeah. kind of his mindset about what reading is kind of encourages the game of school yeah 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 so that was really telling for me and at the same time i couldn't really lecture him because i'm like wow you've really figured out how to do this <laughs> know, you know like yeah, so yeah. he was smart about it i yeah. mean work smarter not harder right but yeah. at the same time I'm like geez you really loved this book and you've now will probably never go back to it because by then it'll be long forgotten so that was a side rail sorry about that um i did hop on my soapbox after all um so 
that's where that's where I stand with Accelerated Reader. So maybe just for uh, sake of fairness, I'll I'll just maybe mention a few of the other sites that are sure. listed on the site here. Yeah. So top educational sites trending overall based upon year over year increase in students visiting the site. Number one, like we said, was Cool Math Games. Mm-hmm. Number two was Renaissance. Number three was quizzes. Mm-hmm. So a lot of teachers doing formative assessment type sure. things. Ed Puzzle, Scratch is number five. Study dot com is six. I'm not familiar, I'm not familiar with, with that, that. one. Mm-mm. Uh, those FET simulations for science mm-hmm. were on there at seven. Nitro type, I don't, don't know, know that, what that either. Is. Uh-uh. Desmos, sure. the math graphing calculator, and Grammarly round out number 10 on yeah. there. And some of those are great sites. Mm-hmm. But sure. um, at the same time, if we think, well, they also, they might be seventh on that list, but they still come after our Google Apps for Education. You know, I think some of it is too, is. Um, we're kind of just wondering where those creation apps are at or those sites, you know, creation yeah. tools. Those are still a lot of consuming. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't you agree? For sure. Um, I mean, I'm looking down at like 19 and 20 on this yeah. list. Business Insider and Forbes. Yeah. So. That's the real deal right there. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> just some interesting data maybe yes. to have a, have a look at. Yeah, for sure. All right. I'll start round number two. Okay. And he says here that uh, YouTube grabs almost 21% of usage in the Google category. So when we include the Google suite in there, mm-hmm. 21% of uh, time is spent on YouTube. And he says, yes, there are endless numbers of videos that you can teach about anything. And when we cut access to YouTube this fall at one of his elementary schools due to students being off task, they found out that how much they rely on it for independent learning. So they opened it back up again. But Andy would like to see a breakdown of the actual types of YouTube videos mm-hmm. being watched by students on their sure. Chromebooks because he is afraid that there's a disproportionate number um, that are kitty cats, <laughs> dumb web series and music videos yeah. leading the pack. But there's no proof that that's, that's what those are. No, that's, right. for, that's, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, right. that's not data that probably GoGuardian is able to collect. Right. Um, YouTube would have better... Uh, access to that kind of data but sure. uh i think you know it it is a problem i yep. mean when you think about schools that are still thinking about trying to ban youtube it's mm-hmm. for things like that when they yeah. see kids doing yeah stuff like that yeah I, and at the same time with youtube it's still consuming not creating Ex- yes for, for sure. the most i mean yeah. you can be putting your own stuff on youtube mm-hmm. but i my assumption is that that is not where this 21 percent usage is Another assumption here, Mindy. But, uh, I know. I, and that, that's, yeah, right. Right. that's why I said For I'm sure. assuming. Um, yeah. So, you know, I love YouTube. I think YouTube's great. I learn all kinds of things on YouTube. It's the first place I go if I want to, um, you know, see a tutorial on something or things like that. But I'm not going to lie. I mean, I watch cat videos sometimes. I know it. It's hard. And I think, you know, hole. when I think about my own usage of YouTube, I mean... Yeah, and yours will be the same. Sometimes you go to YouTube for an educational purpose. You need to learn how to do something, how to figure something out, Mm -hmm. or you want to explore a new topic. And then sometimes you're just flipping through to see the latest Avengers trailer or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. You've got two sides to to how people use YouTube. So, I mean, I don't know if any of this usage involves, like, home usage as well. Yeah, I don't know. Like, when the kids are at home and they're not at school and they're browsing on YouTube, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I don't know for sure. Yeah. But um, Amber sent me a, a blog post today I thought was kind of interesting. Oh, yeah? It was called How to Use YouTube Video Essays, and it was by Mindshift KQED. Uh-huh. Um, and I can link to that, but one of the interesting things on there was um, it said, media literacy education must deal with YouTube because 91% of teens use YouTube. And that's 30% more than Snapchat, the next closest social media competitor, and even more than like Gmail and stuff like that. It's crazy. 91% of teens use YouTube, isn't right. that? So, I mean, mm-hmm. in some ways, you, you could look at this as a problem or you could look at it as an opportunity. opportunity. Sure. Because, you know, there's some ways to think about, you know, like appropriate times to use YouTube or appropriate ways to use YouTube. When is it appropriate to be looking for your Marvel Avengers trailer? And yeah. when is it pro- appropriate to be looking for, you know, help and how to solve these quadratic equations or whatever else is you're working on? Oh, yeah, that's one I'll have to look up. Yeah, quadratic. I, I would need what? to watch that video several times. Several times in slow mo. <laughs> Even just to have her pronounce quadratic equations, I think. Yes. Did I say it right? I think. I did. Yeah. 
All right. So rant number three goes on to say, um, zero sites for creativity are listed in this study. We know fewer kids are getting to create with Keynote, iMovie, and GarageBand due to device choice because those are all um, Mac but it, or iOS, I should say. Um, but it doesn't look like they're getting many chances to use any of the Chrome-based alternatives to these apps either, such as um, no Soundtrap, no Canva, no Wii Video, no Pixlr, no eMaze, all things that I think he was hoping were going to be on that list. Yeah, and I, I completely um, agree with that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Again, it comes down to device usage and how what you're asking sure. kids to do in the classroom. I guess it's when you use those Google tools your docs and slides and all that kind of thing that's going to cover a lot of your usage so sure. there's still some creation in there you're yeah, creating docs absolutely. creating slideshows creating right. forms or or whatever else mm -hmm. but yeah getting those really creative tools out there for your recording audio or creating graphics and yeah. editing video there's definitely less of that on that list yeah there is and i think that that's why we continue to share things that we come up with because we want to see you know Hopefully some of those things being used. Are there any things that you'd add to that list? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean a couple of things in the notes here. I mean, definitely, I think the Adobe Spark uh, oh, yeah. suite is well worth a look because that's sure. all web-based. There's some something new coming from them in April where yeah. they have somehow, and I haven't got all the details of it yet because I don't think they've released all the details yet, but you'll be able to use that with kids under 13 soon. Yes. They'll be able to take your their that's school so login. Murky. Right? Yeah, it's like yeah. I don't. You can use your school login to log into Adobe Spark being right. under thirteen. But what that login is, I don't, I don't know. know. Is that either. a Google Teacher login created, or is it? Teachers are going to create class rosters. I don't, I don't know. know. It'll be interesting to see what. Or they if come they're up doing with. like single sign on or or yeah. something. Oh, but yeah, yeah. So that mm -hmm. will help um, with that side of things come yeah. April. But you know, if you're a Microsoft school, you could use things like Sway. Sure. I mean, we've looked at things like S'more before. Yeah. Buncy. We mentioned Book Creator for Chrome right. earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have Chromebooks, then yeah, that's a great one to yeah, use because right. it's optimized for Chrome. <laughs> um, Seesaw. Yeah, which has all the built-in tools to create yes, right inside. For recording video and recording yeah. audio yeah. and taking pictures. That's why I love it. It's yep. all right there. And I, um, I don't know if you knew this. I'm taking a course on um, Scratch right now. Did I tell you that? I did know that, yeah. Yeah, so um, I have been kind of digging in a little bit with Scratch. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Scratches, it's um, a coding program online for students to create projects. Um, there's a lot of I, – I was actually surprised some of the ways that um, students are using it. So lots of games, yes. Um, but also um, I saw one yesterday. I was watching it. It was a girl, and she was – reflecting on her journey with scratch and she created like this video inside scratch of her talking about where she had began with scratch and how far it had taken her and it's mm -hmm. like oh you know like i yeah. to me scratch still was just you know obviously so much coding holy cow i'm still trying to figure it all out and um I'm, right now i'm just trying to remix projects and that's just looking at somebody else's stuff and figuring out how it works but yeah. Um, just the creativity that I've seen and I, I look at it and think, how do kids even, how is anybody, I, these are great ideas, like very inventive and, um, just lots of great ways that kids are showing what they know in a real, something that they've created, not just, you know, an answer on a worksheet. Yeah, you're so, right. Yeah. And I mean, this, this whole blog post as well as like the Chromebook challenge and things that I did yeah. the other week, it's kind of inspired me to do something at one-to-one on oh. Chromebooks, oh. so I'm going to do like a, I'm going to try and submit a proposal for a Chromebook creativity uh, session yeah. and, and see if that gets accepted. And, yeah, and people love there. it. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's demand for it. It might not be that people, you know, aren't using these tools as much as they don't know what tools to use yeah. on a Chromebook. I agree. Can I do this on a Chromebook? Yeah, it's like, well, right. yeah, you can. Right. Go here and do Don't it. you think some of it is because people moved um, from maybe a more powerful device and a Chromebook isn't quite as powerful in itself, but during that time we've opened lots of new sites have, yeah, you know, opened up and mm -hmm. people don't because they're used to using their one way. Yeah, like I can't do this on a Chromebook because I can't download a program onto it or something like yeah, that. Yeah, or so things like yeah, you know right. we used to do this in iMovie, but you can't get iMovie for the Chromebook. Oh right. well, yeah, and <laughs> right, sure. well, and they don't know what the alternatives are. So right. yeah, yeah, I think it's part of that for sure. Yeah. All right, so we put the right the world to rights on uh, Chromebook creativity. I think so. Is there a Chromebook crisis? 
I don't know. I we don't know. know. Yeah, I don't right? know. We just got to keep doing what we're doing. But it's a good conversation to have, a yep. good conversation to be thinking about in, in your school if you've got Chromebooks. Uh, or with any device. I mean, yeah. how are you using that device? Yeah. Um, are you using it mainly for consumption type things or are you being creative as well? Right. Good balance of both is always great. I think so. Yeah. All right. On to my favorite part of the show. It's Tech Nuggets. You've got three on here. You go first then. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to be, I'll be short with my three because I do have three. I just wanted to put them in there. Yeah. Um, The first one continues our Chromebook theme, Mindy. Yeah. Because Screencast O Matic is now available for Chromebooks. Yay. So that's one that if you've ever used it on Mac or PC, uh, you'll be familiar with Screencast O Matic. Uh, They now have, I think it's kind of a beta app, but Mm -hmm. you can download it for free. Uh, there's no watermark on it right now during oh. the beta period. No. Get in while you can. Get in while you can and make all your screencast videos <laughs> yeah. while you can. But uh, it, it's a Chrome app that works on Chrome OS uh, that you can install. And it really looks a lot like the version you do on Mac and PC. They've got like a very similar kind of interface. Um, there is the same 15-minute uh, time recording, but no limit on the number of recordings you can make. Oh, nice. And if you want to pay for the Pro version, you can. Okay. You don't get a lot of extra stuff on the oh. Chromebook, though. Okay. Um, because all it really gives you is unlimited recording time per video. You don't have, oh. like, the video editor you get on Mac or PC. Right. However, if you buy the paid version, you do get a license to the Windows or the Mac version, so you can use it on a Chromebook as oh, well as nice. on a okay. Windows or a Mac, and then use your video editor on and the other device. PSA, don't make videos longer than 10 minutes anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that would be good PSA. <laughs> okay. Um, my tool is called Newseum Ed. I hope I'm saying that right. It's kind of got this Newzella thing going on. Like sometimes people say Newzella and yes. then I call it Newzella. Uh-huh. Um, so it's Newseum ED, I think, or Ed. I'm not sure. And actually, um, I'm going to give a hat tip to Jennifer Gonzalez for this one. I came across it in a blog post of hers or something. So this is kind of an interesting tool because it's a website that supports media literacy. Um, and it has a bunch of lesson plans for teachers and different resources and ideas of how to address media literacy in your classroom. It is free. Um, and so you can access things just by going to the website. But if you create an account, you get complete access, which is still free. So Just some different lesson plans, different ways to kind of um, have students look at their online reading for bias and um, looking for mistakes by the media. Just just kind of interesting. Lots of great digital citizenship stuff, I think. And a lot of times um, digital citizenship can be kind of tough, I think, for people to think of ways to use that in their classroom or how to bring it up or how to work with it and teach it. And I think this is a great resource. So I would definitely go and take a look. Okay, so how are you pronouncing that again? Museum Ed. Museum Ed. <laughs> I like it. I'm going to go with that. Yeah, museumed.com. Dot org. Dot com? <laughs> what? Do your next tech nugget. <laughs> okay, so my next uh, tech nugget could also be used on a Chromebook to okay. create something. Ooh. Um happenstance Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm going to give a hat tip to Richard Byrne because he uh, wrote a post saying there's a new redesigned Make Beliefs Comics website. Have you ever seen this website before? I don't think so. So this has been around for a while. Yeah. Um, It's a website and they actually do have um, a mobile app for iPad I believe Um, and it used to be you could only create like a three grid um, comic strip mm-hmm. and you basically drag and drop the characters up there okay. and uh, put speech bubbles next to them and create like a little short comic Okay. well they've updated it now so that um, you can now create comics on any digital device, desktop, laptop, tablet or a mobile phone Nice. and you can also build up to nine panels in your text, in your comic now Yeah. so that uh, you can make slightly longer stories so so do you use the characters that are already pre-made? 
you move use characters are already pre-made yeah, okay. yep um and you just drag and drop them into place nice. you can change the background you can add yeah. some text you don't even need to log in or anything to use uh, the tool mm -hmm. you can just go to the website hit create comics which is nice for for all age groups you can print them save them as uh, as jpegs and things like that too once you're done nice so i like comic strip stuff I like comic strip stuff yeah. too. And I think in this age where we have all these uh, comic book movies and stuff in the in the theaters, mm -hmm. that uh, kids have a, an affinity for that sort of thing yeah, too. Yeah, sure. So, make beliefs comics. <laughs> make beliefs comics. <laughs> That's hard to say, dot right? Com. <laughs> yes. Um, my tech nugget, my second tech nugget is youthvoices.live. Um, and this one came to me from our very own Gina Rogers. Uh, she shared this at our coaching across contents, um, conference and it's an online blogging and discussion forum for students. Um, there's a ton of stuff in there and it's been a while to be honest since I've heard her talk about it, but um, it allows students to read each other's writing, kind of a global audience, um, authentic audience sort of platform. It also, interestingly enough, kind of provides guidelines for different genres of writing. So if you are, um, if your writing is going to be like a nonfiction piece or something, it gives you like a list of things that maybe you should think about before you start writing. Mm. Um, even like quotes and things like that, you know, just like little refreshers about what a nonfiction piece should look like, which I think is nice. Um, it also allows students to comment if they log in. There are some student podcasts there. Her and I were trying to figure out how that works. Like, I think maybe you have to put in like a request to have your podcast um, hosted there. I don't know. We were we couldn't quite figure out how that worked. It's not like a ton of podcasts, but there are some on there that you could go and listen to. So um, if you are looking for a platform like that, I, I'm not sure what the age recommendation is on it, but I would definitely not say I, you know, seventh grade and up possibly. Okay. High school for sure. This sounds Most like an archetypal Gina Rogers kind of site, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. And yeah. she kept talking about it and the more she shared about it. So it's definitely got lots of different aspects of it. You could really take some time to, you know, dig into it. Great. Yeah. I like it. Youthvoices.live. Youthvoices.live, yeah. Okay. Well, my last one, I'm, I'm going to say this is an un, unofficial tech nugget, Mindy. Okay. Because I, it has not been tested or vetted necessarily okay. by myself. But mm -hmm. my daughter came uh, home in the last couple of weeks, and uh, one of the new programs they're using at her school is Prodigy Math. Yeah. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. So... She is borderline obsessed yes. with this. Agreed. She mm -hmm. is yep. so hooked on this that she'll come home and first thing she'll want to do is play on Prodigy Math. And yep. I'm like, what? And I have never seen her so engaged or motivated by yeah. math before. Yeah. And, you know, it is a game-based type of um, math environment. But, you know, they, they do this pretest with the kids where they put them in paths based on their ability so that's always trying to help uh, you know adapt to mm -hmm. what they know and what they don't know yep it's a platform for uh, grades one through eight and it says here they do over 1200 crucial math skills but it, it collects a lot of uh, data back for for the teacher so the teacher can look back and see what the students are getting and not getting, what they might need more practice on. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe the teachers can also like assign um, assessments and specific skills to the kids. And all of that stuff um, apparently comes at the very reasonable price of free. Right. Um, there's nothing you can pay for unless you are a parent. And I would say they make their money off of the parents. Yeah. So yeah. The, the parents can uh, pay optional parent upgrades which unlock extra game content e.g. new hairstyles for student characters yeah. and things like that so I don't know and it's not cheap though I don't think on the parent side is it are I you looking at it I have not ever um, received anything like, from Prodigy oh. yet as a parent to I feel say, like it's even like a monthly subscription oh okay yeah but I could be wrong it's, most, I haven't looked at it for a while either but um, most things are monthly subscriptions these days yeah, aren't they that's right so uh, yeah Tate loves it too and yeah, he's really into, yeah, like, because after you earn so many points, then you get to buy stuff or whatever, like, within the store, and that's where your upgrades come into, like, your hairstyles and your clothes and things like that. Right? Unlock your child's math potential and choose a membership. The yearly plan oh. is four ninety nine a month. Yeah. Which is billed once at basically $60 a year. 
yeah. or you can pay monthly at eight ninety five a time if you want to. But, yeah, and uh, I, I, that's what I was thinking. It was ten bucks a month, so I was off, I guess. But but yeah, no, she's yeah. totally. But into I suppose it. if they love it, they love it. Right? I know, and, and wanna... she keeps asking me questions like, "How do you do this?" And I'm like. Well, I, I I can't believe you need to do that in fourth grade right know, now. Yeah. But it really pushes them on into uh, the new skills. Yeah, sure. So, Prodigy Math. There we go. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm looking at what's left in the show notes here. And yeah. looks like we have a couple of podcast picks on yeah. here, too. Yeah. And Mindy's brought a podcast to the table. I did, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep you waiting on that one just for one <laughs> second, though, because I know you're on the edge of your seat. Because uh-huh. um, our, our good friend, Clay Riesler who was here a couple of years ago. Two summers ago, right? 18 months ago mm. when we did iPad U. He was our keynote speaker. He has started a new podcast called The Advantage Podcast, along with two other teachers from his school, Taylor Baumeister and David Bentz. And I've listened to a couple of episodes of that, and it's very good. Yeah. Um, I don't know why that sounded surprising, but <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> um, so David is a, a math teacher, and Taylor is an ELA teacher, which I think brings a nice kind of balance yeah. to it. And then there's Clay, who does the tech integration somewhere in between. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking for a new educational podcast to check out, you could do a lot worse than check out our friend Clay, who has the Advantage podcast. All right, so mine is not education-based at all. Um, I recently started listening to um, Someone Knows Something, and um, it has – actually, they're releasing their – they're in the um, – currently releasing season number four each week, but I am – just finished season number two. What's interesting about Someone Knows Something is each season they take a different cold case and um, try and find out what happened to the missing person or the person who has died. Okay. Um, so the first season is much more safe for work. Right. Season two gets a little bit hairier. Mm-hmm. Um, have the headphones on for that one. Had the headphone. Yeah, don't listen yeah. to that one at work or with your kids in the car. But um, I've have probably in the last month like listened to three different podcasts that are more like criminal investigative genres it's I would becoming say. your new genre isn't it it is yeah. it is um so i really enjoy this one actually lynn kleinmeyer is listening to it too and so we've been kind of talking about it um so if you like those kinds of pod or you know podcasts where you know this is definitely one to listen to. True crime drama. Yeah. Is it good storytelling? It is good storytelling. So we had um, discussed a couple other ones that we had listened to, and I feel like this one probably isn't as good as S-Town, also not safe for work, um, mm-hmm. but would probably come quickly after that. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it's pretty high on your yeah. on your scale of yes. 1 to 10. Yeah, that's like good. It. Yeah. All right, so that really is all we have time for this week. If you enjoy the EdTech Takeout, we'd love it if you shared it online with other people. Uh, Some people who have done just that, I want to give a quick shout out to. So Joe Dale, Mr. Middle 2, a.k.a. Louie. Bonnie Kramer and Stella Pollard have all been guilty of sharing our podcast with other people on Twitter. (laughs) So uh, thank you to you guys. We very much appreciate that. Um, if you want to leave a review on iTunes or in the Apple Podcasts app, you have my personal guarantee that I will read it aloud on the show. Team of approval. Yes. I am at Team Carney on Twitter and Jonathan is at Jonathan Wiley. Our team account is at D-L-G-W-A-E-A. And you can use our new hashtag, hashtag EdTechTakeout to take the show because Twitter now has 240 characters. So we are celebrating with our longer hashtag. If you prefer, you can send us an email to podcast at GWAEA.org. And that's all we have for this episode. So until next time. This has been the EdTech Takeout. We hope it hit the spot. For more information on today's episode, please visit dlgwaea.org slash podcast. 